You don't, um, don't encourage them. There's something for everybody in Dublin. That's the point, okay? Hi, my name is Claire, and if you don't know already, I'm Irish. And I decided that this year I was going to bring you on a 1916 walk and tour of Dublin to try and help you understand why Easter week has such importance for the Irish. Bring your drinks, Richard. We're gonna go upstairs. We'll have a little chat there about the build up to 1916 before we hit the streets. Very special time of year, of course, Easter. The actual rising didn't happen on Easter Sunday. It was supposed to, but it was postponed to Easter Monday. But we celebrate both dates. Now, the most important item for any revolutionary is a weapon. We needed a big shipment though, and in 1914, a great man called Erskine Childers, who was an English Protestant Irish Republican, if you can get your head around that, and his wife, Molly Childers, brought 900 Mausers in from Germany. We needed more, and that's why another Protestant, and a sir as well, Roger Casement, went to Germany to secure a decent shipment. We don't normally use the moniker Sir for any Irishman who bends the knee to the British crown. You know Bono and Bob Geldof have taken knighthoods, so they're off my Christmas list, officially barred from my walking tour. But I'll always use it for Roger Casement because he was stripped of his title before he was executed, so we like to return it to him as a wind-up gesture for the establishment. And he spent a year and a half in Germany and got 20 rifles, 3 million rounds of ammunition and 10 machine guns as an, an icing on the cake and they shipped them on board a steamship bound for Ireland. They disguised the vessel as a Norwegian ship called the Odd. Back then, to communicate between Dublin and Berlin. It's a two-week communication method at the very, very least. And at one stage the Germans sent a message saying, we're going to arrive between Thursday and Saturday. Now, when we got that message a couple of weeks later, we should have gone, grand, no problem. Instead, we sent a messenger back across the Atlantic to say to the Germans, we want them on Easter Sunday. By the time the message got to Berlin, the ship had already sailed and there was no radio on board. And of course, being the Germans, they arrived bang on time <laughs> on Holy Thursday and there was no one there to greet the vessel. Two British warships spotted it on Good Friday, chased it out to sea and it sailed around the corner to the bottom of Ireland to Cove Harbour and as she entered the harbour Carl Spindler the German captain scuttled his vessel off a place called Dawn's Rock and down to the bottom of the sea down to Davy Jones's locker went the weapons for the uprising. Word got to Dublin to own McNeil and he decided to cancel the volunteers role in the uprising. Now habitually in Ireland we say own McNeil cancelled the uprising but Technically, he just cancelled one army, but because they were the largest army who were going to take part, he effectively ruined the whole plans. He also asked a few lads to drive around Ireland, stopping the uprising, alongside an advertisement in the newspaper. Volunteers, all parades, you know, parades, are hereby cancelled. Look, that's the basics there now, right? So that allows us to wander around the streets, and we look at some of the buildings and the story will unfold. If I can just gather you around a little bit closer, I'll show you how to make the perfect walking tour group. Don't leave a gap in the tour group because it'll be filled by an idiot. <laughs> and here's one. John, how are you, pal? It is tempting for me today to go up to St. Stephen's Green and wander around there, which was occupied by the Irish Citizen Army under Michael Mallon, his second in command, the irrepressible uh, female revolutionary, Countess Constance Markovitz, okay? Markovitz dedicated her adult life to the emancipation of the working class in Dublin. She's bang on. Don't listen to anybody saying that she was just amusing herself playing at soldiers. She's the real deal, okay? A great friend to James Connolly. She's the um, uh, most well-known of all the female revolutionaries, okay? In one of my books, I listed off 276 women, a couple of lines about each and every one of them as well. That is the figure for the number of women who fought. So it's not just all about Markovitz, it's about the others as well. And we'll talk about plenty as we wander around, okay? Let's go on this way. 
be careful crossing the road, okay? It's awful if someone gets knocked down and I have to refund them. <laughs> Dublin Castle, that's the castle. It was the administrative centre of British rule in Ireland for centuries. In uh, 1684, there was a very bad fire here. And did you ever hear the phrase to fight fire with fire, you know? That comes from the idea that you could deoxygenate a fire by having a blast of gunpowder. It's something they did in the Great Fire of London only a few years beforehand, 1666. So they set about stacking the gunpowder, but I guess they got a little bit over-enthusiastic about how much they used and ended up destroying three quarters of the castle, you know? But I'm sure the fellow whose idea was was gone. At least we put the fire out, that's the important thing, right? Now, the three main people who ran Ireland would go in there almost every day. You got the Viceroy, the King's representative. The Chief Secretary, Augustine Burrell. Underneath the uh, Chief Secretary is an undersecretary called Matthew Nathan. Now, the day-to-day -day running of Ireland during the early years of the war was down to Nathan because Burrell was over in England. Because of the war, he was on the British cabinet and he was needed in London. So Nathan kept writing to Burrell saying there's trouble brewing, there's trouble brewing. He could smell it in, in the air. And funny thing is that Beryl wrote back to him at one stage and he says, never mind the Irish, they won't rebel as long as they have their breakfast. Meaning that if our bellies are full, we are politically satisfied. And one thing I've always loved about the Rising is that it started at 12 noon, which is a great time, you know, you get me there. An interesting piece of sculpture there, that's um, the Statue of Justice. And you might have noticed when we went in that she has no blindfold on. Justice in Washington or in Paris or in London, she would always be blindfolded blind to race, creed, gender, etc. And there's um, a reason why the sculptor, a fella called Jan van Nost, has her with no blindfold because there was no justice in the 1770s when Catholics could not enter the parliament, most Catholics could not vote. And also she's got her back to the people of Dublin and she's holding the scales of justice with the two fingers that you use to pick something sort of untouchable <laughs> off the ground. There's a great poem about her. The statue of justice, mark well her station, her face to the castle and her arse to the nation. That there would be no justice would ever come from here. This is, this is year 27 of the, uh, of the tour and I hope, to get to, I hope to get to year maybe 40. That's my, my hope. There's a lovely plaque that went up here um, uh, to that wonderful emancipated slave, Frederick Douglass, who's very well known. A good man with a pen, unusually for a slave because it was illegal to teach a slave to read or write. And when he was freed, there was always that potential that he might be captured. And he wrote that Ireland was one of the places where he felt most relaxed because people were very kind to him. And I would say that that's thanks in the main to Daniel O'Connell, who used to give lectures here and talks. And O'Connell used to say, you know, listen, you have it bad, but don't forget there are people in the Caribbean and in uh, the US who are in chains, your brothers and sisters. Don't take coffee, don't drink rum. Don't eat sugar. Uh, he engendered a very strong sense, uh, an anti-slavery ideology amongst the people of Ireland. This is uh, a spot where we get to see one, two, three major buildings. The one down there with the dome on top of it is the custom house. So taxes were collected on goods entering and bizarrely exiting Ireland as well. The custom house also housed all the files on income tax as well. Now the IRA, they burned about 400 tax offices all around Ireland. A very effective attack. But then a month and a half later, the British asked for a truce, a cessation of violence on the 11th of July, 1921. So you could kind of argue quite well that the burning of the custom house broke the British resolve in Ireland, that they said, enough is enough. And that in turn led to the treaty. But the problem with the treaty was, we were not allowed to use this term, Irish Republic. So in the debates, the IRA split, Sinn Féin split, and people decided you're either anti-treaty or pro-treaty. And in April 1922, uh, the IRA reoccupied that building, the four courts. At the end of June 1922, the Free State Army borrowed British artillery and bombarded their former comrades out of that building, thus starting the Irish Civil War. Let's go over the Liffey 
we'll head to the north side. I always think if you go into someone's house and they have a proclamation up in the hall, like that you feel very comfortable in, in, that, uh, in that house. It's a very non-sectarian document as well, you know. It's, it, it's very careful, carefully worded. I often think maybe Connolly was the one who said, make sure it's the Irish men and Irish women, you know. Because one or two of his pamphlets, his political pamphlets always mentioned Irish men and Irish women like that, you know. The memorial to Dan O'Connell, it went up in 1884. There's a lot of bullet holes in the memorial. You see underneath her oh, skirt, yeah. there's one. And in her clavicle, she's patriotism. A lot of them seem to be very purposeful shots, like the one above the red hand of Ulster. And we know that the British were in occupation of that building over there, the white building. So maybe fellas are just acting the acting the maggot, acting the Egypt, you know. Fellas do that, like, you know, if there's no consequences to our actions, we will take aim and fire at stuff. This is a very historic round. It's from the odd. Friend of mine, Ben, he's a diver and he dived down and got a few uh, um, of these. I have a good feel of that. I need some uh, fingerprints on it. There's a lovely phrase underneath Big Jim Larkin's statue in, in Irish. The great appear great because we are on our knees. Let us rise. Jim Larkin was not in Dublin in 1916. He was in America from October 1914. But he appeared in the window of the Imperial Hotel on the 31st of August. 1913, another bloody Sunday. The police arrested him, dragged him out on the streets, and Countess Markovitz was here. She shouted, three cheers for Jim Larkin, and a policeman smacked her in the face, and all hell broke loose. And that's why Jim Larkin and James Connolly said, no more bloody Sundays. We'll arm ourselves into a militia and defend ourselves. And that militia are the Irish Citizen Army. A couple of months into their establishment, a group of women went to James Connolly and they said, what about us? Can we join? And he said, yes. However, you need to learn to dig the trenches, you need to go on the long route marches, and you need to learn how to handle a rifle. So James Connolly is very forward thinking in his uh, idealism in that there's no point in just emancipating the men without bringing the women on board. And it's his phrase, no freedom till women are freed. There are screw holes there in the middle, which are just screw holes, because they're in a perfect line. And I often think people are looking at them, taking pictures of them, but they're from flags that were hanging there over the years. But there are bullet marks all over the building. It's very busy today. Um, I guess uh, it's as busy as it would have been in 1916 and sometimes we get our welfare payments through the post office so it's the same in 1916 women were expecting their separation allowance it was paid on a monday so women were down here looking for their few shillings so the very first of all the women to charge in here was winifred carney she was james connolly's secretary and he sent her a telegram something like come down for easter and she charged in here as his secretary with a Remington typewriter in one arm and a Webley revolver in the other. And I love that she's the best dressed secretary you're ever going to see. When James Connolly shouted, everybody out, we've declared a republic. Most people just looked around as if to go, what the hell is happening? Like, imagine right now if I just went, everyone out, we've declared a new Ireland. People just turn around and go, there's that idiot who does the walking tours, okay? Pierce walked outside and read the proclamation. 20 people gathered around. It was a bit of a downer. For action, they smashed all the windows in the building. If you're ever surrounded by the police or the military, or there's going to be a shootout, smash your windows because you don't want more glass coming in on top of you. They then barricaded themselves in with leather-bound ledgers and journals and sat there waiting for the British to come. Now, a group of Lancers came trotting down the road on horseback and there was a barrage of fire so intense. For the first time in Irish history since 1798, the British army turned on their heels and ran from the battle. So I'd imagine you'd be tapping your comrades beside you saying, lads, we're going to be 
beat these guys, look at them running away. But very easily, euphoria can turn into trigger happiness and boredom as well, okay? On Monday and Tuesday, an awful lot of looting went on in this neighborhood. And that's understandable when you consider the poverty, okay? For every thousand children born, 142 never saw their first birthday. Kids are going around with no shoes on their little feet and their little bellies empty and aching all day long. So their only hope was the promises of Jim Larkin and James Connolly. But it's understandable when they saw the cops had disappeared, they kicked in a few windows and robbed whatever they could get their hands on. But the problem with the looting is they were setting fire to the buildings and the intensity of the heat was unbearable. I think it was Seamus Robinson, a Belfast man, who said it was so hot you couldn't lean against the wall of the post office because you'd leave your hand behind. But on Friday, the whole roof was caving in, so they decided to evacuate the building. And who led the charge out of here? Only the O'Rahilly. Remember that great man I was telling you about who drove around Ireland stopping the uprising? He went around saying, if I can get 30 men, we lead a charge down Moor Street, break our way through the British lines, past the machine gun, and make our way to Williams and Woods Jam Factory. And he's going around saying, lads, who's with me? And only a couple of fellas put their hands up. It wasn't enough. Pierce jumped up on a desk and he gave an impromptu lecture to referring to Wolf Tone and Robert Emmett and people we talked about today. And the hands went up. They all went out the back. His best friend, Desmond Fitzgerald, ran over to him. He says, Michael, best of luck. I'll see you later. He says, Desmond, I'll never see you again. You were a good friend. And he shook his hand. He blew his whistle and they went roaring down Moor Street into the jaws of death. And he was shot to bits by the machine gun. And five lads behind him were killed as well. O'Rahilly wrote a little note to his wife to tell her what had happened. It's very beautiful, he says there. Darling Nancy, I've just been shot leading a rush up Moor Street. I took refuge in a doorway. While I was there, I heard the men pointing out where I was. He means the machine gunner. So I made a bolt for the lane I am in now. I got more than one bullet, I think. Tons and tons of love, dearly, to you and to Nell and to the boys and to Anna. Names all the family, his sisters and his kids as well. And then he says, it was a good fight anyhow. Lovingly yours, O'Rahilly. Please deliver this to Nanny O'Rahilly, 40 Herbert Park, Dublin. Goodbye, darling. And he signed off and put the note in his pocket. And to me, that, that is one of the most important documents from the whole rising, as important as the proclamation. Because here's a message from the grave, a fellow who fought, and he's saying to you, listen, don't overanalyze it too militarily. Come at this with the heart as opposed to the head to see where the victory is. Because you don't always have to be the winner to be the victor. Thank you very much for coming on the tour. May I recommend you also go to Kilmainham Jail? Glass Nevin Cemetery, another wonderful place uh, to go to as well, where all these uh, revolutionaries were buried. If anybody wants to come back to the pub, you're most welcome. They have a lovely Irish stew in the pub if you want, and uh, there's a fellow there flogging books and badges as well. So I have a uh, shop online, it's lorcancollins.com, and I'll sign a book and send it to you anywhere in the world. I want to say thank you so much to Lorcan for having me on the 1916 walking tour. Please check out Lorcan's website and book him if you're in the country. Every tour is different, you're not going to get the same one as me. All the footage together that I got was just under two hours, so I haven't spoiled the whole thing for you. He's incredibly knowledgeable about the subject, he has the crack. It's really informative, engaging, fun experience and I would definitely recommend booking with Lorcan if you're in the country and if not he does have books and badges for sale on his website so thank you so much Lorcan. If you enjoyed this video you might like a recent video where I went down to Dunamore Famine Workhouse in County Leash where I met the amazing Michael and his dog Lily. And Michael told me all about the famine in Ireland, the British involvement in the famine in Ireland and the famine workhouses. Big thanks to my patrons that helped make this series possible. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Slán, slán.